this is um, William Sharkey with uh, UW Green Bay Sheboygan campus. He is a professor of geography and geosciences, and um, he also owns and operates Land Shark Landscaping and Consulting in Milwaukee, um, which uh, focuses on low maintenance landscapes that also function as extensions of urban environmental renewal and integration with surrounding natural systems. Uh, so without further ado, we will introduce uh, Professor Sharkey. Thanks again for coming. We humans within a Western society, within cities versus country and so on, we have these subdivisions of environment. We have our built world, uh, which is this controlled space that we've completely remodeled, we've gardened it, we've built it, we function within it, we drive through it without paying too, too much attention. If nature comes into it, it's a little bit of a problem, usually involving some sort of chemistry and weapon to push that nature back out at bay. But on the periphery of this environment, we have what's called nature. Uh, this somehow wild space where nature does some stuff, and it's the space that we visit. Uh, we go hiking in it on the weekends. We go camping in it uh, when we have some time. Uh, perhaps we even road trip to say something like a national park. But even these natural nature spaces aren't truly wild in many cases. They still have, to a large extent, been impacted by humans through resource extraction or through construction, roadways or buildings or whatever it is we're doing. And thus, the nature that's there is kind of natural, but altered. And then beyond that, we have this other nature that very few of us ever go to actually see, the wilderness. This very, very wild space. And we tend to not go to the wilderness because things literally there can kill us. Things can literally happen to us. It's where the big predators still roam. It's still where there's lots of bugs. Uh, if trees fall down, you have to walk around them. There isn't some convenient guy with a chainsaw clearing the way for you. These are wild, and for the mass majority of us Western American sorts, we want those spaces, we value those spaces, but we don't access those spaces. And so as a result, our perception of the wild spaces around us is either those that are within our yard and our parks and our built space, or just at the periphery. And all of those spaces have been changed. So when I take my students out on field trips to a field or some such like that, or when I was out at the Ice Age Center recently with my geology class, I literally tell the students, all right, I want you to walk through the yard and I want you to find five native plants in the next 30 minutes. And so they'll go out there and they'll pull leaves of this and leaf of that and leaf of this and leaf of that and a bit of this and a bit of that, and they all come together about a half hour later and lay out their, their, their aha, I found X, Y, Z. And I'm like, not native, not native, not native, not native, not native. Oh, you found one native one. Okay, great. And they don't understand that the vast majority of the grasses that you're looking at aren't native here. They've been introduced through the colonial period somehow, some way. They don't understand that a lot of the flowering plants that are in the periphery of our building environments are escapees that now exist so ubiquitously. When I tell students wild carrots not native, they're like, what? It's been there my whole life. Your whole life and your parents' whole life and your grandparents' whole life. It's still not native, but it is what we call naturalized. And so what is native, what isn't, often comes down to what we perceive it to be, what is somehow valuable to us in our immediate built landscape. Getting in our cars, living around, we just don't often catch that stuff. So a lot of what I teach in my classes and in my public speaking is just about how, I mean, the big problem we have is there is an environmental crisis up there. There is a lot of things that are happening in, in wild spaces right now that native plants are disappearing. Right now we've done uh, entomology, entomological uh, studies, bug surveys basically, and we've recognized that about a third of all insects have disappeared from our native landscape here in Wisconsin. Now for most people they're like, good. Fewer bugs, less of a problem, less to clean up, less things to kill with the place water and so on. But that has a larger impact on the operation of the natural systems and the wild spaces. Those bugs serve a purpose. They have a niche within this wild landscape. They're food, they're predators, they're consumers, they're controllers. They all have a functional role in the system. But our use of, of pesticides and agricultural landscapes and in our yards and then the built landscape, removing so much of the landscape, they're fading from the landscape. 
And for most people, that's good because their windshields are clear. And that's about the end of that, right? Well, no, it's a bigger problem than that. You're supposed to have a dirty windshield because your windshield isn't supposed to be taking out so many to start with. But somehow that doesn't impinge upon our daily, what we need to focus on stuff. Uh, coyotes in the city, big problem, big scary thing. They can get your animals, they can even attack people on occasion. That's a scary thing. Nature isn't supposed to come into our built spaces. When nature comes into our built spaces, it's something we feel like we have to react to, control somehow, call the DNR. But the truth of the matter is, is people don't realize how much of the native landscape that those species existed in has now been eliminated, and those species need somewhere to function. Mountain cats, for instance, mountain lions in California is a big problem. They're moving into the urban landscape with greater frequency, and they're not afraid to attack people in, in, in resource-poor environments. When there isn't much else for them to hunt, they will hunt what's available. Unfortunately, people do occasionally fall prey to that. But we just don't, we have this perception, there's a divide between my built stuff and that wild stuff. And the wild stuff is supposed to respect that line, and wild stuff doesn't know there's a line there to start with. And so we have trouble uh, looking at nature. It's more of a problem than a solution in many cases. So when we're talking about invasive systems, this is a little piece from my lectures, there's basically three broad ways we look at ecosystems when we look at the wild functioning of a thing. And these three top words there, resistance, resilience, and redundancy, kind of encapsulates the whole idea of ecology. When we talk about an intact ecosystem, one that's healthy, that's functioning, there's a lot of species that have come together over evolutionary time to work in a cooperative way. Each species eats certain things, accesses certain resources, other species eat other things and access other resources. And through this cooperative behavior of ecosystem operations, the system has filled all of the available niches. So for a non-native species to come into that system, it's difficult. There's not a lot of food for them to eat because it's already being eaten by dominant species already present. There's not a place for them to establish themselves because the spaces are already filled by the established species of the system. So the system is basically resilient. It's resistant against invasion or even disturbance. When we talk about a primary forest, for example, a climax forest, fire is very, very rare in our northern forests. They're mature. They shade the landscape. They keep a high humidity at ground level. That high humidity keeps a lot of water in the soils and in the underlayer, allowing for rapid decomposition. So there's not a chance for fuel to build up. There's not, it's too wet for fires to really get going, and so fires happen, but rarely. But if we go in and take out half the trees, well now, the sun can get to the bottom of the floor and dry it out. Less water means less decomposition, so there's more fuel build up. The drier the condition, the higher the probability of fire. So now that we've altered the system by removing pieces of it, we've reduced its resistance to the disturbance. Wind can topple trees more easily if there's just a few than if there's a hundred of them. Fire can burn through a thinner system than a thick, full-fledged climax system. And the same is true in the basis of species of plants or animals. If the system is intact and fully operational, it is very difficult for species of non-native origin by human transport to come in and establish themselves. So that first, that's the first thing we have to look at whenever we look at a natural system. Wilderness is resistant. Nature is not. Built definitely is not. Built can allow anything to come in and establish itself because it fits into the nooks and crannies that are available. Next is resilience. Say something bad does happen to a system. As with you, you get sick, you get knocked down, you spike the fever for a period of time, you're at death's door. But somehow you recover. Your immune system kicks in, your resources come to rally around you, and you recover and you bounce back. You have a high resilience. You're a strong organism in this regard. Well, Mother Nature is kind of the same way. So there are some environments, such as the east coast of the United States, where hurricanes happen all the time. That's a disturbance. Hurricanes blow through, it floods. Trees get knocked down, tornadoes tear stuff up, Mother Nature is a train wreck once the hurricane gets done. But in very quick order, that system has dealt with that disturbance so many times, the plants and animals in that system 
can recover quickly. It's just like it got the flu and can quickly bounce back and reestablish the system in fairly short order. So as long as the natural system of the natural plants that are adapted to that reality are there, the system can recover. But if we remove some of those key species and replace them with less resilient species, well now when a hurricane takes out southern Florida, half the vegetation is eliminated and cannot return, it's not native adapted to that level of disturbance. It doesn't come from an environment where it had to adapt to that reality. And as a result, we now have a lot of dead wood on the landscape a lot of dead material on the landscape that we now have to pick up the bill to remove because it can cause fire, it can cause all sorts of secondary threats. Because the resilience of that system to recover is entirely up to us. We have inherited by our alteration the cost of that healing and reconstruction, which costs our economy billions of dollars every year. It's a huge payout for us recovering from natural disasters, which Mother Nature is prepared to deal with, but our alteration of Last of this is redundancies. As with everything, if you have an electronic device that has one primary circuit, and that circuit is disrupted, the device is dead. So the more redundancies you have within the system, the better able that system is to deal with one part of the system going down, other parts of the system can pick up the slack and carry on the work. So in a healthy system, for example, you don't have one herbivore, you have 20 of them. We have deer, we have elk, we have bison, we have this, we have that. You don't have one predator, you have a number of them. You don't have one of anything. The system has multiple copies doing similar or near similar work, so that if one species is damaged through disturbance or disease or disaster or human intervention, other species can still function in the system and do the necessary work. The more of those species we remove, though, the more and more it falls to us to act as the primary redundancy. For instance, here in Wisconsin, through the late 1800s and early 1900s, hunting was a primary uh, cultural activity of the vast majority of Wisconsin males. It was a European legacy. A lot of our food resources came from hunting deer. Therefore, cougars and wolves were in direct competition with those early hunters. So it was across the United States. It was the primary mission to remove those wolves with, rap with as much uh, rapidity as we could and we then took over the primary predator position. Well, that worked for a while. The trouble is, for the last three generations, there's fewer and fewer young people wishing to engage in the hunting process. So that means more and more white-tailed deer survive to perpetuate the next generation, which means they are literally over-browsing their landscapes and causing all sorts of ecological collapse as a result. So what are we left with? Either A, we get more people engaged in this process of us being the primary predator, or B, we re reintroduce the predator itself. So we have, in many areas, reintroduced the wolf to great success ecologically. The trouble is, is the wolf has a storied history in the human psyche and our perceptions of it. So when you look at most people in an urban landscape, they have wolves as sculptures and photographs, and it's somehow spiritual and its symbolism is this free and powerful wild thing. Okay, but then the farmer has to deal with those wolves affecting their, their calves or affecting their sheep or lambs or some such because they are opportunistic hunters. There's free food, they're gonna get it. So the rural farmers or the rural folks have to deal with that predator more directly. They have a more physical reality of it than an urban folk do. Unfortunately, most of us here in the United States are now urbanized, and so the fight is a hard one for us to discuss. Removing the spiritualism, moving the predatorism, and trying to talk about the wolf as a functional aspect of an ecosystem is a factual conversation that not a lot of people can sit and listen to without engaging one side or the other of this kind of emotional argument. So how do we reintroduce redundancies and still leave out the human built stuff? is a very hard problem for us to try to solve. Right. So, we talk about those climate systems, that's what we encountered as our, our ancestral co uh, colonists came here and started disrupting the things. <coughs> Did anybody write any records down? Yeah. They were so busy with ax and saw and everything else that, we, that unfortunately the naturalist scientists didn't breeze ahead of Columbus and document everything. And, its ranges and species composition and tendencies and so on and so forth. And so today we're saying, okay, we're gonna return this back to natural and native. <clears throat> what, what's that? 
it turns out in Wisconsin, at least in the Milwaukee area, we have only one documented sort of kind of plant survey done by a gent named Increase Lapham in 1830s. The next botanical survey doesn't appear in the record until the 1960s. What? So what happened to everything in between? What was all the micro and macro habitats? What was all that stuff? Well, we don't know to a large extent what the climax of botanical population out there truly, truly was prior to disturbance, turning into agricultural landscapes and so on and so forth. And so we have to extrapolate through scientific studies of similar habitats elsewhere to try to figure out what that climax is supposed to be. Thanks to folks like Aldo Leopold, who another Wisconsinite in history and time, we now have a firm understanding of environmental science and ecology by which to base those kinds of studies and going forward. But it's still a struggle for the common folk because it's not something we automatically teach as part of our primary programming. This is what environmental science is, this is what you need to do, this is how you need to understand it, conceptualize it. We don't get that as a primary consumer of education in this country in that way. And so, again, it's not something in the forefront of the majority of citizens' minds to say, this is how we're supposed to do this properly. Instead, it's left to the gut. It's left to an emotional response as to what nature is or should be. So that becomes thus the debate in much of this. So once we have a disturbance, human caused or otherwise, we then have this natural reset to the system, which I talked about, eventually returning back to climax in time. So if you go to northern Wisconsin, we clear cut that clean slate in the late 1800s, early 1900s. There's very few standing trees once our ancestral lumberjacks got through there. But if you go up to northern Wisconsin now, you can't look anywhere without hitting a tree. They're all only about yay big, but it's treed over again, which tells us that left to its own devices, certain biomes and ecological systems will reset themselves even outside of direct human intervention. But not all systems can, nor do all systems do it in the same rate of speed. We have an indulgence here in our tempered biome. Of all the biomes out there, the tempered biome recovers on its own the fastest. The tropical, the arctic, the desert, the peripheral wetlands do not. They take much longer arcs of time for the native species to reestablish themselves and go through the process of succession and return to that original climax forest. We humans don't have the patience for that. We want to do it in one human lifetime. But the truth of the matter is, is it takes two or three human lifetimes for this to really go through the cycle. So it's a multi-generational investment that somehow we have to invest not only in our kids, but in our grandkids in order to keep that process going. And that's a hard thing to do, especially from a government perspective. Governments every four years can change and be fickle. And so it's hard to keep a consistent plan operating on that arc of time. Somehow it's supposed to be faster. So when we lose this resistance due to our removal of key parts, this is when invasive plants have an opportunity to come into the system. With that original intact system, non-native species, animal, plant, or otherwise, have a hard time coming in and establishing themselves. They can't access resources because they're already being utilized. There's no space for them to come in and fill because it's already filled. But once disturbance has happened, now space is available, now resources are underutilized, and invasives can now finally come in and begin to establish themselves. And so really since the late 1800s, invasive species have been coming into the United States in ever-increasing volumes because we humans move stuff. And we disturbed a lot of stuff. And a lot of those early invasives, we just didn't really conceptualize what was going to happen. Why do we have starlings here? Does anybody know where starlings came from or how they got to the United States? Yeah. The two were back. What's that? Shakespeare. Shakespeare yeah. Society, yes. They were putting on some, the, some Shakespearean plays in New York uh, in the late 1800s, and to give an authentic feel to the presentation, they brought all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare from Europe and released them in Central Park. And starlings have now taken over the United States of America. They've become very successful in their spread and fashion. Uh, there was another group of, of fundamentalist Christians in the early history of the United States that tried to do the same thing with biblical birds. Unfortunately, desert birds don't do as well. But just the same, they also, for the same motivations, to bring what they knew of home or spiritual tradition or cultural tradition and replicate it here. Because this, after all, is just an extension of Europe. It didn't occur to them that this was fundamentally a different place. So now those species are here, what do we do? Can we remove them? What's the cost? Who's responsible? Well, cost on that scale requires a large cooperative effort. It has to fall to the scale of government. 
the government isn't willing to make the investment. So does it fall to the hands of citizens? Well, we have active groups such as this one, but it doesn't involve the entire community. It's only small activists within it, and sometimes that's a difficult action to undertake. So we have uh, ecosystems are sort of, I mean, even our native species can be a little bit of a problematic uh, occurrence in all of this. We generally think of non-native species as those problematic species. But I can tell you what now, if you get a box elder invasion, it's the end of your existence. That is a native tree that is hyper-adaptive to disturbed landscapes. It thrives in riparian corridors. That's where it evolved. Riparian corridors flood, things get damaged ground, you know, trees, you uproot them, but, but box elder doesn't care, it'll keep growing just perfect now. And fortunately, you clear away all the unavailable forest to serve the soils, and buckthorn will take over. The same with red cedar, which is another native tree, but given the opportunity, clear away the competition, boom, all you have is a red cedar forest all of a sudden. So this idea of invasiveness really covers both native and non-native species very often, even though in much of our minds, it's only the non-natives we have to worry about. But native species are just as engineered to take over disturbed landscapes as the non-native ones, and you can cause equally as much problem. If you've ever had a cottonwood invasion, you can sympathize with me. Because nothing's worse than 50 cottonwood trees going into the bloom cycle. They go there. They're fuzz all over the place. So, a couple of key words here we got to deal with when we talk about all this plant stuff. First, at the very top of this, is this idea of native. Well, we live here in Wisconsin, and as you well know, about 8,000 years ago, there was a giant ice sheet over us that is now gone. And when there was an ice sheet here, there were no plants. So therefore, by definition, nothing is native. It was just ice. That ice retreated, and all of a sudden, all of this vegetation comes crumbling in and establishing new ecosystems as it expanded into this new range that became available to it. So how do we slice and dice this word native? Well, take the human piece out, basically, and you've got native. Animals and plants that spread through natural dispersion, establish an ecosystem in a new habitat, survive and thrive through multiple generations of replication of their own power. In other words, these species are spreading under the laws of natural selection. If you go there and can survive the climate and survive the conditions, you can stay. Die in winter, you out. Die of predators, you out. Die from fungal disorders, you out. So the natural conditions act as limits on species as to where they can go, how they survive and thrive. So by definition then, species is indigenous to a given region or ecosystem. If its presence in that region is a result of only natural processes with no human intervention. In other words, it survives and thrives by its own invention. I don't know about you, but I didn't see a possum until I was about 20 years old. There were no possums when I grew up. Well, it turns out possums aren't native to Wisconsin. They're actually native to South America. They came over the land bridge a couple, a couple thousand years ago, and they were in Texas and the southern states for a long, long time. They didn't move into our area of the world until about 100, 150 years ago, depending on where you draw that line. There are new species here. But there are species that came here, found a niche they could survive and thrive in, and now occupy that as a naturally expanding species. So they're considered native, even though they're a native new arrival. If you ever go up to Horicon Marsh, there's pelicans up there now, black tip pelicans. First day I drove by Horicon, and I saw pelicans in the sky, I just about wrecked my car. I was like, what? <laughs> the pelicans? What? This isn't Massachusetts. What the heck? But there again, there were pelicans here at one point in time. They have reintroduced themselves, but there we are. It's just these species find opportunity, they can spread. They are here by their own natural forces. So a couple of ways to look at that. Now when we talk about plant species or animal species, we have this whole classification of what they are by family, you know, animal, plant, family, genus, species, so on and so forth, by which we classify them and their relationships. But when we talk about plants especially, we get lost in a little nomenclature here. What is a variety versus a cultivar? So it turns out a lot of plants are close relatives to each other, and plants within the natural landscape can have several varieties amongst them, just like humans can have several varieties amongst them. They're all still fundamentally the same species, but they have distinctive characteristics that make them slightly different from their cousin down the road in some way or other. If you have any hawthorns in your yard, try to identify it, I challenge you. Because here in Wisconsin, we have over 20 varieties of hawthorns. They're generally said, well, the flower is pretty much the same amongst them, but some have thorns, some do not, some have low leaves, some do not. But the children of them are fundamentally different than their parents yet again. So they're basically hybridizing as near relatives, and so we get a lot of composition and mixture in them. 
Now, we, our ancestors, would find certain varieties and breed the plant for that variety, and we would get something specifically that we want through selective breeding, which is a lot of how our domestication came along. We found a particular plant that had characteristics the others didn't have, and we brought that into domestication. Cultivar of that aggressive, intentional human process is the result of that. We've hybridized plants to such a degree that we humans drove that evolution of the plant. And we've resulted in something that we can give a distinctive classification as a cultivar too. So cultivars and varieties, varieties are natural variations of the hybrid process. Cultivars is the human product of that, which is more aggressive and much more detailed and focused. In an animal, we would call that a subspecies, but in a plant, we call that a variety. So when you go to the store and you're looking for a new plant to put in your yard for landscaping purposes, there could be a lot of varieties of native plants or non-native plants. But what's distinctive amongst them is different varieties have distinctly different characteristics. They may produce different fruit. They may produce different sizes. They may have different colors, different root structures. And some could be problematic and others not. The trouble with that is if you get a variety of a native plant, it's maybe not a variety that's common here. It can hybridize with our native crop and change the native status of our plants because a variety has been introduced that's not particularly dominant or occurs in this region. So it may be regionally native to the Midwest, but not specifically native to Wisconsin. And that can be somewhat problematic for some plants and species. And cultivars, the same thing. I don't know if you've ever seen an Alberta spruce, but what you're really looking at is a white spruce with dormant. It's a spruce that has a genetic mutation that prevents it growing into full bloom spruce. Every now and again, you'll see one spruce arm kind of comes shooting out of an Alberta spruce, and you want to cut that off so it keeps its nice form. But what you're looking at is a genetic mutation that we've turned into a cultivar. In nature, it wouldn't persist, it would die out, but we found a way to exploit that for our landscaping purposes. So that's just an example of what we're talking about. So when we talk about invasiveness of things, some varieties of some plants or cultivars of some plants are very problematic. But other varieties of cultivars are not. In addition to that, some plants are unisexual, in other words, they have both sexes in one plant, and some are what's called dioecious, where the sexes are split. If you have ginkgo trees, you have probably, most likely, a male variety of a ginkgo. Because if you have a female ginkgo tree, you will regret it to the day you're dead. Because the fruit of a female ginkgo tree hits the ground and smells like rotten meat. So we use ginkgo because it's a really tough tree. It's a beautiful landscaping tree, but we have to wait till that tree grows up enough to prove itself a boy or a girl. The girls go away, the boys we keep and plant on the roads because they're a meager urban tree for what we want to use it for. So that's another aspect of cultivars sometimes we have to consider is how do they manifest the sexes and therefore maybe one sex or the other is advantage for what we want it to be. Native range then just talks about where the native occurrence of this species are. There's a couple of websites we're going to look at real quick that kind of lets you look that up so you have a better idea of what kind of plant you're maybe wanting to look at from a native sense. Because here in Wisconsin, we have a lot of trees that are native to the United States that are not native to Wisconsin. And if you know black locust, by chance. Got an expert back there. Black locust has some wicked thorns on it. It's these beautiful, breathtaking white blooms in the springtime that are fragrant with the perfume. But it's a cloner. It'll establish an entire colony of itself and take over entire landscapes in just a handful of times. It's native to Kentucky. It doesn't occur here. It was brought here because, oh, this is a cool Kentucky tree, we'll bring it up here. And now it's taking over Wisconsin and other areas in the Midwest. In Kentucky, it has natural predators within that region that it has evolved with. Here it does not. There is no limit to its growth here in Wisconsin beyond human intervention. Cutting it down doesn't kill it because the root mass can go for hundreds of square yards. So you kill one, well, 50 more is going to pop up. So once a plant like that gets in, how do you control it? But Officially, it's native. So by law, by intention, by desire, we're focusing on the non-native plants. We're not looking at a native, native cultivar, or native species. That is also problematic. That isn't supposed to be here. We have catalpas all through Wisconsin, which isn't invasive, but it's a commonly planted landscaping tree. It's not native here either. It's exclusive to the, the Mississippi River border. It doesn't occur as far away. Or for that matter, honey locusts also don't naturally occur here. Again, it's restricted to Liverpool. But it's an advantageous tree. It has uh, botanical qualities we like, and so we spread a farm ride from its native landscape to expand its range to a broader native landscape. 
that's good. So is that a problem or not? It can be. Right? So native range is something we have to calculate in all of that. So non-native has all these other words to it that's kind of hard and fuzzy and hard to divide. We have non-native, we have exotic, we have invasive, we have uh, invader. It turns out when we talk about these plants, especially under policy and law, those words have powerful meanings. Invasive is any plant that invades an ecosystem by human introduction. That can be native or non-native. So oftentimes when we think of invasive, we think only as a non-native invasive. Well, it can also be box elder, it can also be red cedar, it can also be other native of, uh, species that now are acting as an invader in this particular scenario, like disturbance or whatever it is we're creating. So non-native is specifically defined to define those plants that we humans have introduced somehow, some way, accidentally or intentionally. It's native someplace else, it has qualities there that made it able to survive here just fine. The trouble is the vast majority of those non-natives come from highly disturbed landscapes such as our native box elder. Areas with strong winters or riparian corridors with a lot of flood damage and so on and so forth. So we take it from its native habitat where it's a survivor with, uh, by the tooth and nails of its existence and we throw it in our garden and it takes over the landscape because here it has less to deal with and can be more aggressively colonizing because it's able to dominate the competition. But then we have non-natives, invasives, and non-natives, naturalized. So we have a lot of non-native plants that have been introduced that have somehow found a niche within the landscape that they inserted themselves into without causing too much undue disturbance to the overall system. Queen Anne's lace being an example I already mentioned on that one. Oxide daisy is another one, the, the original chrysanthemum. These plants are ubiquitous. We see them everywhere around. It doesn't occur to us that they, or a lot of the other wildflowers you see, are in truth not native. They have been present in the landscape for so long, they're clearly not pushing other species out. And so for much of the passerby of the observer, it's already native. It's already here. And when it comes to law regulation or effort, those are the ones we tend to ignore and go, well, it's here, it's naturalized, it isn't messing anything up, so we're going to leave it be. So it's important to kind of get how we classify things. So, here in Wisconsin, we now have a law. Talk about a tooth and nail fight. It took about 15 years to get this law formulated and finally on the books. But we do formally have a law that regulates what plants are here and what plants are supposed to be here, what plants we're going to leave alone, and what plants are, uh, are we have to somehow control. So we're going to go to that in just a second, because you can go to the DNR website and read that law. But the law also has its verbiage for what a plant is or isn't be or and so on and so forth. They don't use the word non-native, native, naturalized, and so forth in the law because those words have so many multi-meanings in culture that it's hard to build a law using them. So we have different ways of classifying plants, and this is what the law uses. Prohibited, restricted, caution, not restricted, pending. Well, now, based on the science that we know of that plant and what it does in other environments where we've seen it be, the law requires that we know the thing is bad. It's bad somewhere else, it's not here, so therefore we're going to prohibit its introduction here because we know for a fact it's been bad somewhere else. So it's working off of known quantities. Thus, plants that haven't yet proved themselves to be problematic anywhere are allowed. It isn't until you are a problem that you get put on the list. Can you give us some examples? Yes, we're going to go to the website. So, just to break down this real quick, prohibited invasive species that are not currently found here, uh, with the exception of small pioneer stands, perhaps somewhere where it has gotten in and we might be fighting it, recognizing it in some way or other, uh, and that, or it may be in a larger Great Lake kind of basin area, maybe an adjacent state, even if it's not necessarily in Wisconsin. Uh, but it's been introduced by human activity. They're likely to survive and spread if they get here, potentially causing significant environmental or economic harm. Restricted invasive plants that are here. We know, we recognize they're here. Uh, and in the state have caused or have the potential to cause significant environmental harm or economic harm or to, uh, harm to human health. It includes established non-native fishes and crayfishes, fish and aquaculture trade, fish and aquarium trade, non-viable fish species. So these are things that are here that we've already recognized are a problem. You may not dig it up and move it. You have work in all power to remove it from your property should you find it there. Caution, species that cannot be placed in one of the other leaves. 
In other words, it's an unknown quantity. Knowing what we know about its cousins or its near relatives, we caution whether we should allow that plant to come. Even though it hasn't proved itself to be a bad player yet, eh, we're going to put a label on it and say maybe not. But it's still sellable. We can still put it within, within the store. Non-restricted species that have some beneficial uses as well as negative impacts on the environment but are already integrated into Wisconsin ecosystems, a.k.a. naturalized. They're already here. They've already integrated. We're not going to bother messing with those. We're going to recognize they're there, but we're not going to try to lay out any action of the law on this. Right? Pending species that we're not assessing for classification at this time, but plans may be looked at in the future as science allows. So, if you go to the DNR website, you can see this law here. So, in the, uh, I shared the PowerPoints that I'm showing you tonight, so you can have access to all the websites I'm going to show you here. But here's a quick summary of, of the law, the verbiage of the law, and so on and so forth for you to look over if you're so interested. Um, here is the species list of that law. So there's a whole list of species, a complete list of the regulated species. Because that has animals on it, too. We're just talking about plants. Right? So we're just going to look at the plants here. So this is a list of all of the current plants that are, on, uh, are being governed by the law. So in the perimeter category, of course, we have Japanese knotweed, chow flower. We have porcelain berry, which is like a viney plant. This is the, the genus species name of it. So you can Google these at any time. Copy, paste, copy, paste. See all the pictures of the cows come home. Some of these are familiar to us. Some of them are not. Uh, bitter cress, uh, knapweed. Spotted knapweed, diffuse knapweed, Russian knapweed. Uh, we have some thistles, Scotch broom. Uh, Home Depot got busted big time with the law last year because in 20 Home Depot stores in Wisconsin, they had broom plants everywhere on the shelves. And someone went, uh, mm, no. <laughs> That's made in Scotland and it's very invasive here. And Home Depot was like, oh, so sorry. Uh, and they were given a pass this time. That's not fair. They eliminated the plants from the shelves. They didn't allow any sales. Someone identified them on the shelf before sales began. And so they were able to kind of backpedal. The trouble is, is Wisconsin has a law against that species, but Minnesota does not. So Home Depot being a multi-state entity buys things in bulk across the whole organization. They have these regional laws they also have to manage, and something slipped through the, the ringer here and there. Do we have a state agency out there looking at the shelves of all the landscaping companies out there each spring? No, we do not. The only enforcement we really effectively have for this law is you. You knowing the species, knowing what's to be watched, taking pictures, reading names, reading cultivars, going to the list and seeing if it's on it. I have several friends of mine in Milwaukee that print this list off and they literally go down the aisles and look and see everything if it's on the list or not just to do their homework and act as the watchdog. Unfortunately, the way our state is working, we pass the law. If the law is reported, the state comes down and elect that. And we don't have police officers looking at all the plant labels just to make sure everything's in compliance. That is where citizen action comes into the primary. Uh, giant knotweed, if you're familiar with Japanese knotweed, it is the bane of your existence. I promise you, you will fight hard and hard to get rid of that. It will not die by glyphosate. You literally have to dig it out of the ground every square inch of that mugger, or it will come back to haunt you. Water hyacinths, we all know the water hyacinth story in Florida. A lady went to, uh, uh, to a conference in uh, South America and was given water hy hyacinth as a presage. Uh, while she was there, she came home, thought it was beautiful, she floated in her back pond, and it took over the state of Florida in five years. <laughs> so you can't go anywhere in the canals and backways of Florida and or all the way onto Louisiana because that plant is effectively taken over all the waterways. Good thing cows will eat it, so they sculpt it out and feed it to the cattle, but just the same. One one sweet intention resulted in manifestations on that scale. So of course here it's definitely illegal, but it doesn't survive our winters very well, fortunately. Uh, polygonum, another form of knotweed. So here we have a whole list. Notice here, right about here, we have uh, pennyworts, which is another floating plant. It's kind of this little plant. We can see that a lot of it in, in, in more water gardens. Swamp morning glories. It's now a large argument that we want to ban some morning glory seed sales here in the state of Wisconsin. But how do you stop that? Because if you've ever had morning glories in your yard, you'll never be free of them again because they are prolific reproducers. 
Uh, Asian markweed, and marshweed is coming in as a type of thistle, which is common in wetland environments. It was introduced again as a kind of a rain garden kind of a plant at one point in time. Japanese honeysuckle, buckthorn, of course, are both illegal for moving, transport, or sale here in the state, but they're ubiquitous in the landscape. They are just everywhere. Yeah? Who would have been against this law? Why did it take 15 years? The landscaping industry didn't want to do it. Because landscaping. It, the landscaping industry was the primary advocate against it. There's, I mean, when you talk about these plants, a lot of these plants are popular as landscape varieties. There's literally millions of dollars on the list that they cannot sell now. And so, much like every other market, we're looking for the new fancy thing. What's the new shiny plant? You go to your landscaping shop there every spring, and here's a new something around there. I, I'm a landscaper. I'm like, ooh, pretty. Uh, you know, I do the same thing everyone else does. And my first question is, now i got to go home and research it. So I photograph the tank, and I go home and see where it's from, what does it do, whether it's not. So fortunately, a lot of the plants that we see are annuals, in that here in this environment, because of our winter, they can't survive. If we were a little further south, it'd be a different story. So habitat has a lot to do with what, okay, somewhere else it may be a problem, but here we can get away with it for summer to the guys. So if you have an interest in these, so that is the prohibited list up there. Then next here we have the restricted. These are here. Is Fred Whitey's on that list? Oh, you betcha. Okay. <laughs> on the top list? Yeah, it's on the top oh, list, okay. absolutely. But Fred Mighty's is already present here, so it's on the restricted list. The trouble with something like Fred Mighty's is this. We have a native Fred Mighty's, which is nearly identical to the invasive one. Oh. So which is which? In short, the only way to tell if it's native or non-native from my is to snip a sample and send it to the UW Extension for, for genetic, genetic or cellular analysis. So there was thought, for instance, of the Sheboygan bog, or excuse me, the Cedar bog, that uh, Phragmites was invading the bog. They sent samples and run, no, that's native Phragmites. Leave it be. So to the casual observer, it's really hard to tell the difference, but somehow the, the uh, uh, Phragmites astralis is the non-native form. It has somewhat of a better edge at getting into habitats and setting up its clonal habitats and just taking over large colonial masses and forming those very, very quickly. It does that far more aggressively than our native form does. Our native form doesn't form these colonial masses the same way and take over things the same way. Even though, by the casual observer, they're, they're the same thing. We also have a non-native tree, if you're familiar with high bush cranberry. Nice, lovely native bush. It's these beautiful red fruits on them in the fall that the red uh, cedar wax wings and the cardinals love all winter months. But the vast majority of the time what you're looking at is actually the European variety. Because our native variety doesn't do all that well in sculpted landscapes. It likes to be out there in the wild. The European variety has no problem being trimmed within an inch of its life along someone's house. So as a result, but if you look at the native form and our wild form, unless you've got a magnifier, you can't tell the difference from the casual observer. So some non-native species are just very close cousins to our natives and are problematic for that but still to the casual observer, I can feel the same. So looking on this list, you have great my days, don't you see it, kill it with everything you have. And that's one of the few things where really we have few options beyond a chemical response. It's just so difficult to get out because literally just that much of a root mass will regenerate the whole plant fiber. So short of taking up the entire landscape and hauling it to a landfill or sifting it all out, it's a very th it's a difficult thing to extract in physical efforts. So it's all... Chemical? Uh, Chemical mowing. Mowing works, but most most Phragmites grows in open water or near shore areas, so mowing is not right. So a chemical response of some kind is our best option. Most of the time. Same with Japanese Navi to, to an extent. Mm -hmm. Especially considering the scale of it, we just don't have the hands and many shovels to go out there and just attack. And digging up an entire coastline isn't necessarily a good ecological response either, because that much disturbance just allows more invasives from other varieties to come into that disturbed environment and it has a negative impact and erosion and all other factors too. So it's a, it's a problematic problem. So you're spraying your water? Yes. Uh, there's specific varieties of herbicides that are that break down very quickly in aqua environments. So they can be drawn by the plants, have the effect on the plants, and then break down biologically quickly. They're not a very effective herbicide because of that, but they do work for things like purple blue stripe, great mites, and a couple of other plant species that are above water surface. Underwater, that's not. Rodeo is probably the most famous, uh, well-known variety of aquatic herbicides in the sense. But there's very specific quantities and applications as to when you do the pattern. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. 
So here we got a lot of the restricted ones here. So we have wild chervil, hill mustard, marsh thistle, poison hemlock. Yes, the very thing that killed Socrates is a non-native plant here, so don't chew on it. I was in the field. A student thought he had a wild carrot in his mouth. I just about knocked him out as I tried to yank the plant out of his mouth without scraping it on his teeth. <laughs> yeah, he won't see the world. Uh, Manograss, Japanese hops. Uh, a lot of people have planted Japanese hops thinking it was beer hops. It's not beer hops at all. It looks a lot like beer hops in terms of vine and leaf, but not fruit. And so they thought they were planting something for the microbrew and instead got an invasive plant. So that has been spread around quite a bit. Kudzu has now crossed the Illinois border. It's within 30 miles of the Wisconsin border in the southwest corner of the state. So if you don't know what kudzu is, it is the vine that took over the south. It literally will grow a foot a day by its own volition. Uh, it was introduced by the Soil Conservation Service in the 1930s in response to the Dust Bowls. So we introduced 37 varieties of Gutsu we found them before we found them that we live here, and then it pretty much took over the Appalachian Mountains. So it's very good soil stabilizer. The trouble is, is it literally overtops everything else. It just climbs over everything and buries everything in its vine structure. It's edible. Go eat it if you can eat enough. But it's, if it gets into the southwestern Wisconsin, the driftless area is effectively going to be covered over by a vine. It can survive winter? Oh, yes. It, it, it is alpine tolerant to a very large degree. Uh, seaside goldenrod, again, goldenrod, everywhere here. One more goldenrod amongst goldenrods, who's giving a notice that one? But this one will take over beach areas very aggressively, but people don't differentiate that it's different from varieties. We also have what's called the blue star aster, which is a beautiful blue aster you see through the urban landscape. It is not native. It's introduced and is now everywhere, but it's an aster amongst asters. So from a native view, it doesn't occur to us that's not supposed to be here. Uh, so, but you can see on this restricted list, there's there's actually some, you know, not as many on the perimeter, but there's still a number of species here. So I would encourage you to read through this list and just familiarize yourself with some of the more species. Now, of these species, they're not, they're, especially the restricted ones, you've seen them, you know them. If you know your, like, mulberries, red mulberries are not native here. Fruit's delicious, though. Or not red, excuse me, white. Red's native, white is not. So the white mulberry is, is delicious. It blooms at the same time as our native red, but it's a weed tree. It pops up everywhere in the landscape. In the landscape, the birds love it. Why is it here? Well, they try to introduce the silk industry to the United States, and it turns out the silkworm eats mulberry leaves. And so they introduce the silkworm and the, uh, the mulberry, and now we have gypsy moths and white mulberry trees. So that's where gypsy moths came from, because they produce a silk cocoon, much like the like silk caterpillars uh, uh, will well, live here. But gypsy moths will. Silk industry didn't work. Caterpillars got out, and here we are. We're not stuck with that plant forever. So that's just examples of how these things get in here in this regard. So that is all the law covers. So on here you have approximately 150 plants. In the landscaping store, on average in Wisconsin, there are over 400 different non-native plants introduced within the landscaping market every year. So most of those plants are cautioned. We don't know what they're doing. They're not currently causing a problem, so their sale is allowed. So again, it comes down to it, are you making a native choice, a native cultivar choice, or a non-native choice? You have to, unfortunately, again, natives somehow have it within our cultural impressions to not be that showy, to not be that dramatic, which is why the cultivar industry of natives has really gotten going, trying to get natives to be something a little bit more dramatic so that it, even if it's not a pure native, but a native cultivar, it's still something better to plant in our yardscapes than these entirely exotic non-natives, which we don't know how they're going to respond as we go forward in time. Now, if they're contained to the urban landscape, that's one thing. But of course, they escape to the native, natural periphery all the time. Which is how the Aren't the landscaping companies, don't they have any mm -hmm. ethics? Yeah, it's called profit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the essence of it. That's the core of it. It's, it's what is, you know, we are here to make money, we employ people, we have an economy to drive. I mean, we're talking a multi-billion dollar industry. And to tell them they can't do this means we put a lot of farmers, a lot of cultivar growers and producers, a lot of botanical scientists out of business. And, I mean, your apples are all cultivars, your pears are all cultivars, your bananas are all cultivars. They're all non-natives here in this region. Apples are not native to North America. They were introduced by our colonists, Johnny Appleseed. 
so citrus trees are not native to, to the Americans. These were introduced by our ancestors. But yet they're you know, something that we value as a domesticated agricultural product. Well, it is just the next step to make something pretty, something enduring, something with sentimental value as well. So fighting that is the problem. So what is the native potential of a plant? That's something we have to assess through a scientific lens, but also as a consumer. So when we're looking at a plant, these are the things to consider as to whether or not that plant is invasive or has the potential to be. First off, most plants, like I said at the store, their current set of adaptations or environmental tolerances will not allow them to survive. So if you get lantanas or, or canna lilies or any number of other things, beautiful in the yard for the moment, but come winter, they're gone. But as climate change manifests, our winters get milder, more and more of these species are able to winter over. So if you've ever heard of, of Jenny Wurt or Penny Wurt, it's a kind of a vibrant, <coughs> lanky green plant that it's for a great ground cover, kind of spills out of pots in a very dramatic fashion. Go along the river corridors of Wisconsin, or along in Milwaukee, and it is entirely that one plant in the understory of the trees. How it got there, why it's there, who knows, but it's ubiquitous. I have a small patch of it in my yard I've been trying to kill for five years now. I pluck it out, I pull it out, and every year there's a little line coming out of somewhere. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it is the cracking of all things to try to get rid of. So they have a very long persistence. They establish a root mass that has a lot of energy storage. It's a really hard time. If you ever try to get Creepy Charlie out of your grass, same thing, right? You can mow, snip, yell, poison, whatever you want to do, and somehow that thing keeps popping up somewhere in your lawn. So it's these kinds of things. What kind of a root mass does it have? How much energy can it store is a big thing in a perennial, one that can persist from the same source every year. From seed, though, how long can a seed endure in the soil? For the vast majority of non-native plants, it's somewhere between 5 to 20 years. In other words, you drop a seed, it'll lay there until the conditions are perfect, and then boom, it's up. So garlic mustard has a 10-year uh, seed bank uh, endurance uh, uh, cycle. So we can go out and pull garlic mustard for 10 years and still get garlic mustard. So it's one of those things that's really, really, really difficult to extract. And how does it even distribute those seeds? So when you talk about garlic mustard, I, I challenge you to find a garlic mustard seed. I mean, they're the, the teeniest things in the world, but one garlic mustard plant can produce 10,000 of them. So one plant, one seed cycle, and now you have a seed bank that's enduring for the next 10 years. So, and they're so small that just stepping in the mud and stepping away, you're carrying with you 500, 600 seeds as you walk across to the next space. It's a big problem we're having things with the wild parsnip. So trails, human access corridors, even animal uh, deer trails and so on, those are the invasive conduits. Those areas are disturbed. The soil is constantly churned by the traffic of humans and animals. This gives these non-native species an opportunity to establish themselves along the trail establish reproducing populations, and then spread out into the wild landscape from there. So we have that kind of seed to consider about there. Resource competition. A lot of these non-native plants are really good competitors. So garlic mustard is another one of those evil plants. It literally changes the soil chemistry, prevent, introducing a toxin that all the other plants around it cannot tolerate. Black walnut does the same thing. I challenge you to grow tomatoes under a walnut tree. It won't happen. Because jump zone goes in, is introduced in the store to eliminate tree competition of native varietals. And as a result of that, black walnut can dominate a forest landscape for a period of time. Garlic mustard does the same thing. And once you remove the plant, that allopathic change to the soil can persist for years, making it very difficult to then go in and now introduce native plants. They can't tolerate that chemical change, and as a result, we have a harder time establishing a native population now that we've removed a problematic plant. So allopathy is something we have to consider. Buckthorn, I don't know about you, go hiking in the spring, snow's barely off the ground, first leaf on the plant is buckthorn, followed quickly by honeysuckle. Those two plants come from northern Europe in these highly variable, very intensive winter landscapes. They have a short growing season. The sooner you get your leaf out, the last you drop it, the more time you have to gather that photosynthesis energy that you need before you go into dormancy. So our native trees, they don't start, my native trees on my street, I time it every year. The first ash leaf that I see is somewhere late April. Buckthorn, Norway maples, they've had their leaves up there for a month already. So they are already shading out the landscape by the time our native species wake up and start doing what they do. 
As a result, they can suppress the germination because our native plants also have a later germination cycle. By the time they get ready to emerge from seed, the ground's already shaded. And so through this dense shading they produce, they effectively eliminate native competition. So our natives just don't have a way to circumvent that. Uh, next to that is who's fighting for the resources. You're the first one out to leaf, you're the first one to get the water and nutrient. By the time our natives wake up and begin that, native, that nutrient extraction, it's simply not there. And so our natives are constantly losing out in the battle for resources because they don't wake up soon enough to, to get into the war at the point they need. Our natives begin to lose their leaves in August and are pretty much in dormancy by, the, by, by mid October. Buckthorn doesn't drop its leaves, honeysuckle doesn't drop its leaves until almost December. So it's taking out every last inch of those resources it can get to outcompete everybody else. Diseases. Our native species, our native animals love our native species. That's what they've evolved to consume. They know them, they recognize them. Deer will not eat buckthorn. They don't recognize it as a food source. In addition, the leaves have a high tannin content and are not palatable or easy to digest. As a result, none of our native predators, none of our native herbivores, want to eat buckthorn. Our native birds don't like to eat buckthorn berries until winter either, but that poses a problem. One, the fruits are hyperduritic which basically the birds eat it, and they immediately drop the seeds all over the landscape before they have a chance to even digest the seeds. The seeds pass through the system very, very quickly. But also, because they're the last thing the birds want to eat, those birds also, that fruit ferments. And so by the time the birds eat it, they literally get intoxicated in the consumption, and that causes a high mortality rate in most of the birds. So it's a problem and confounding problem of having these species. Now, buckthorn is dioecious. They're male and female plants. So the ones with berries are the females, and they're the ones we have to target and remove first when we're trying to eliminate the species from the landscape. But of course, those seeds now are distributed everywhere by birds. Now, one thing that can, to a degree, control, for instance, right now, we're trying to eliminate emerald ash borer from the landscape. Well, our first strategy at this, short of removing the trees, is to introduce a native wasp of its native habitat, which is parasitic. <coughs> It lays an egg on the larva of the, of the emerald ash borer, consumes those larvae, and destroys them. We tested it for 10 years. It won't touch any of our native bugs for once. We know this absolutely. We've now introduced seven populations of this wasp here in Wisconsin, hoping that it will at least suppress the spread of EAB within our native landscape and hopefully preserve our native ashes. But it's projected at this point in time, within the next 50 years, ashes will be eliminated from the Midwest. They're simply at the rate of EAB expansion, there's no way to get at it. So we're seed banking. We're collecting seeds right now and holding them in long-term storage, waiting for the day when all the ash trees die, EB dies out, and we can finally reintroduce this species back to our native habitats about 100 to 150 years from now. Oh, that is the cycle that we're looking at. How did EAB get here? Does anybody know the story of EAB? Pallets. Yeah. What's that? Pallets. Pallets. So there was an aircraft that came in from China that had pallets as part of the storage luggage, the pallets were thrown to the side of the Detroit airport. There was thin streams of bark on the edge of those pallets. The EVA, uh, the larval form of, EA, uh, of, the, of emerald ash borer was in that little thin stream of bark. It emerged, established a population within the ash trees around Detroit airport, and has spread out exponentially from there. The trouble is, as we humans see a dead tree, the first thing we do is cut the tree and go firewood. Mm -hmm. The next thing we say, hey, let's take the firewood out to the camp. And so they, we know for a fact that the uh, Chicago infestation established because some folks had a, a summer, uh, summer cottage in Michigan. The tree died. They brought the wood back to, the, to, to home to burn the fire put at home. And they learned about EAB a little bit later. And then they started looking at the trees in their yard. And they fessed up, called DNR, and said, did we create a problem? And DNR is like, oh, now we have to quarantine the whole state. And it turns out they were the epicenter for, for the Chicago infestation. But here in Wisconsin, we now recognize seven different infestations in EAB, which is so far eliminated about 10,000 trees in Wisconsin all so far. Not to mention, of course, the expansion. So one single thing can introduce this, these problems into any other thing. Growing season. So here we have a tough winter, so a lot of the plants we're talking about non native status simply can't make it through our winter cycle, mm -hmm. and so we ubiquitously use them for decorative purposes. Yeah? Um, I just wanted to say we're getting to the hour mark. Sure. I'll wrap up here in just a second. And then we have to, so, so it's a question of what kind of plant we bring in. Tropicals, <coughs> buy tropicals so the cows come home, they're dead come winter. But if you're talking about temperate varieties from, from habitats similar to our own, 
there's a high probability it can go through a reproductive cycle, it can produce seed possibly, or escape that, that use and become naturalized or invasive. So I have a couple of, uh, there's another slide here that talks about dispersal mechanisms. We can skip that because this is the more interesting slide for you to close with. On here, I have a lot of variety. The biggest question I think a lot of people have when it comes to natives and non-natives is what the heck is it? What does it look like? What is this thing I have to worry about? With 150 species governed by law alone, knowing all of them is difficult for even the most practiced peoples, let alone the varieties and cultivars that can be present. So these websites here give you a wide variety of different online sources by which you can simply plug in a common name that you hear or the Latin genus species name, and you can see what the plant looks like, what its ranges are, where it's problematic, and so forth. So is a species native or non-native becomes a very powerful question then. So I have one of these websites drawn up here for you. So here is the UWGB Coffrin Center for Biodiversity website. Uh, so again, and here you can, you can look for trees and shrubs or plants or ferns or any number of things. You click on one of those, and you can even in some cases just type a description of what you're seeing, even if you don't have a name, and it will search the database for close approximations, give you some pictures. I think it's that one that give you the relevant information. So if you suspect you have an invasive in your yard that you're just not familiar with, you can even do a Google image search. You simply upload it to Google and it will find course correlations across the website and tell you what probably your species is. However, that's great, but on this list of things, you also have probably two other vital resources. In the Midwest Invasive Plant Record and IPAW, the Invasive Plant Association of Wisconsin. That is comprised of a membership of botanists, environmental scientists, ecologists, naturalists, and all that sort of stuff. You get on their email server and you go, what the heck is this? And 15 people will reply to you within five minutes. <laughs> so if you take a picture or have anything, or you say, hey, I heard about this thing, what is this thing? Someone will send you a picture within, within a day. Because there's con there active, interactive websites, academics, and so on on here that are familiar with all of this stuff. And you can join these organizations. For instance, I pause a $20 a year membership. You're on their newsletter, you're aware of all the modern control methods, methods that are being introduced. They send out journals and relevant things. They have a website with all the active information for controlling or dealing with specific non-native plants that is there for you to access as a member or even as a lay person who's not a member. But these two organizations are probably the best established in our region and as a vital resource for you to kind of get that basic identification puzzle piece kind of fit out. And if you're anything like me, I go to Landscape Store and I type in all the fancy names and their websites to figure out what the heck this new varietal is that's come through or cultivar is and find out the specifics about it. Because again, specific cultivars are banned by law, but other cultivar forms of that same plant are not. So one cultivar form of a non-native plant may be problematic, but another cultivar isn't, and so it's allowed for sale. So ramness is ramness, buckthorn is buckthorn, some buckthorn are nice, some buckthorn are not. So it's important to know cultivar, which isn't always accessible on all these websites, but Nibbin or IPAW will tell you the exact cultivar you need to know. So, so the late person access. And of course, you have the academic network of BWGB here at your disposal as well. So we have a large taxonomic department on the main campus, but all of the secondary campuses such as Munich Sheboygan. We have a botanist, environmental scientist, and a geographer. So between the three of us, we'll be able to answer any immediate questions you may have as well. So, Questions. I, I'll click through those websites if you want to see more about them. <coughs> so, EAB. Yep. It's if uh, you know if there's a tree in the city that that's uh, that's dead, the city will take it down. There's like 4,500 of them. I think they said. If if there's a tree on your property that's dead, the city will make you take it down. But as you drive on the roads, even just along the interstate, mm -hmm. oh, you'll oh. see whole forests of dead trees. Sad. What happens in those areas when half of the trees are gone? Who, what, what takes over? What's the impact of all those dead ash trees? Well, this is a disturbance. So right. depending on where it is, most probably buckthorn or honeysuckle will take over. Oh. Yes. <laughs> That's Please. the most probable outcome at this point. Because those dead trees make good bird roosts, and so the birds sit there and they drop the seeds, and so they're very ubiquitous. So honeysuckle and uh, glossy buckthorn are the wetland species, and then highland or bush honeysuckle and uh, Rhamnus cathartica is the highland species. So depending on where it's occurring, that's the most probable outcome. 
But natural succession is manifesting. So native birches and, and, and cottonwoods and those sorts of species will come in first and begin to colonize and kind of reestablish, and then we'll move into the progressives of the of ash if they're available. Maples then come in until finally we end in a climax of oak, high maple, or pine as the climax forest if it goes on long enough. So theoretically, with some management, we can allow the natural succession cycle. It takes about, about somewhere between 50 to 100 years for it to get back to, to an undisturbed <laughs> so you can go out there and plant the pine trees and just start right from the beginning. Uh, the trouble is with that very often because we have an oversized deer population. So we plant a lot of trees, but then the, the, the deer come out in the wintertime and browse them. So in northern, Wisconsin, northern Michigan, they actually fence off about five square miles of the forest, drive all of the deer out for the most part, and then fence that off for about 15 years to allow the saplings to get higher than tree than, than browsing height, and then they remove the fence, allow the herd back in and fence off something else. Mm -hmm. And not to try to let native cedars and hemlocks get above browse height and so we can save those species from, from overbrowsing extension. Mm -hmm. But that's DNR, that's large scale money, that's management, that's mm -hmm. checking the fence and driving with the herds, and so, so it's a difficult thing. But most probably most of these dead stands around here will probably result in forest fire. That would be the quickest up here. That's a big problem out west right now. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we have such an active fire cycle out west right now is milder winters in the Rocky Mountains have allowed a native beetle called the, the spruce bark beetle right. to right. now die out. It normally gets killed back in the wintertime and controlled, but nothing is controlling that species and it's removing about 80% of the pine forest in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. Now we have dead pine everywhere and it's just burning and smoking. So that's at least one of the contributing factors to some of these problems. And we're experiencing the same thing in Canada in the rural forest, too. So we're looking at about 50% loss of the forest. Of what? About 50% loss of the rural forest in Central Canada and Russia over the next 50 years. So... From the same deal? Cousin of, but yeah. 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 Yes? I got a question about the sumac. 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 Are there two different kinds? One's yes. poisonous and one is not? No. Okay, well, there's, 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 there's three native sumacs and one sumac name, but not a sumac. Okay. So poison sumac is a wetland species that's not truly a sumac, but if you touch it, it's much like uh, poison ivy in that mm -hmm. you'll get a re reaction to it and so on and so forth. Its leaf looks similar to a sumac, even though it isn't actually. Okay. We have uh, a Rus aromatica, which is like a scrubby kind of grain cover thing. We use it a lot of landscaping. We have the aromatic leaf and you crush it. And then we have the smooth and the the uh, hairy sumacs, which are the large clonal stands, you can collect those berries and soak them in the water and make lemonade out of them. So those are harmless to humans. And they're native. They're native. They're all, all right. Those are all native. All three of them? All, all, all three of them. Not... Even them. They're all native, but they are a clonal species and they can be invasive if they're not controlled. Okay. You get a sumac in your, in your yard, one stand, looks pretty. 50 of them is annoying. You can't yeah. them. So they can be quite invasive. That's why we plant them on roadsides. They're, they're fast soil stable. They're in the marsh a lot, and that must be the poisonous one. Yeah, if you see it in a wetland environment, that's the poison species. Because the hunters come home okay. with lots of it. Yeah, all over. Yeah. yeah, it's not quite as bad as poison ivy, but almost. Oh, yeah. It's like cottage cheese on the taste that they get it around the ear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just have a comment about the uh, bluff restoration project at North Point. Uh, when people are driving along the lakefront, you're going to see the landscape has changed. We yep. have removed a ton of buckthorn and honeysuckle, so that's what's missing. So now that you've heard all this about the buckthorn and honeysuckle, you know you know that those two are not any good. Um, Most of those species are shade tolerant and sapling form, so they can grow in dense forest or open sun. Yeah, that, that choked off yeah. a lot of yeah. good stuff on the bluff. Right. And uh, what's going to be replacing that will be native plants and shrubs. When? So it's uh, we're on a five-year plan. Uh, phase one just uh, started last November. So phase one was removal of invasives along that one area there, but we're going to do the entire lakefront. All invasives are coming out, buckthorn, honeysuckle, the Nor Norway pine. I think we got a, we got Norway pine there too. Right. Yeah. Norway, Any, there Norway is a, spruce? We, uh, no, I think it's a pine. But we have uh, experts that are working on it, and uh, there is a plan. So are we going to plant this spring? Plant the, this spring. Uh, we won't be doing it. Um, I mean, the yeah. project. Uh, are they, where are we with that, Kendra, as far as planting in uh, native plants? I'm not really sure when that's going to happen. They're, they're, they're kind of facing it. Again, we have the, we the, the, the regrowth to, to worry about, so we don't want to invest too much in, in replanting if yeah, there's going to yeah. be some regrowth. 
Um, but there's also the concern of, you know, especially being on a bluff community, soil stabilization is really important too. So um, the they're going to be doing some planting kind of in phases. So enough to kind of get a start of the native small signs, um, but not that we're um, expending resources where then it's going to not be worthwhile. So they've, they've got um, the Friends of North Point put a lot of effort into, or a lot of um, resources into having this management plan developed. So um, it's a good solid plan that we're going to kind of go through in phases. Um, I should also mention if you're not on the LNRP mailing list already, please do sign in with your information if you want to receive more updates about the North Point project and the progress there. We'll give you updates on uh, when some of those plantings and removals and, and so on happen. We also do have a Frank Mighty's and Japanese Not Weed Control Program that we are um, working on countywide. So if that's something that interests you, sign in and we can get you some more information about that. Um, as well as uh, Roots Restoration of our Tree Sheboygan is a program specifically dedicated to uh, mitigating the impact of the Emerald Ash Forest. So we've got a lot of different um, relevant programs going on. So if you're interested in learning more, kind of Stuff. Sign up and get involved. So, in just as a side note to what she's saying, if you go to the IPAW website, one thing, as, <coughs> as a layperson or a member, there is uh, an invasive identification reporting form here. If you see not weed or Fred Mighty somewhere, someplace, you can report it, they put it on the map. That can then be used for targeting for removal. Yeah. The um, chestnut used to be a, a really common tree. Of the native, the American chestnut. Yeah, it was wiped out by a fungus like a hundred some years ago. So they now have two hybridized varieties that are resistant. They're trying to reintroduce, much like elms that are resistant to Dutch elm, to Dutch elms. But it takes a while to cultivate them to get that bred into the population and reintroduce. Well, them. I was going to ask after you know a hundred years or whatever it's been if they've gone through that long cycle of clearing out, you know, the, the fungus that you know that now they can. Just the same cultivar and, and reestablish. And force, there's still enough of them in the environment to perpetuate it, much oh, like okay. Dutch Elm's disease. So, but like, so with Emerald Ash Borer, a tree that big, the bug is going for it and kills it. But with Dutch Elms, the beetles that transport the spore from tree to tree to tree are native, the spore is not, but they don't attack a tree until it's about 15 years old. So it's reproducing, it's doing what it does, as soon as it gets big enough, now it dies. So as a result, there's always a sapling population out there that allows the disease to perpetuate. Yeah. So we can't let it, like emerald ash borer, once the ashes are gone, they're gone. There's no surviving an emerald ash borer infestation. It's not like a fungal infestation. There is no maturity, seed, and die. We, the, the bug literally attacks us out. So there is no hope for that species to get past this invasion. So it isn't until 100% removal that we can hope to make. So that's kind of an anomaly. What was on the pallets that um... bark? Because the, the the beetle larva is right in the cambium, just on, so you have the bark, you have the soft tissue layer, the vascular tissue, and then you have the heartwood of the tree. The but the larval phase of the EAB lives in that soft tissue cambium. But I mean, what was being transported? That it was just the, it was the pallet. Oh, just an empty pallet? Oh. They used it to transport some some uh, stuff from China. It was in an aircraft. Well, that's the company that. Use those pallets should be responsible. Well, the air, no, when, when the plane was offloaded, they simply stacked the pallets on the side of the airfield at the, the freight yard, as we do everywhere in the world every day. And what they didn't know is that the EAB was in the bark residuals on that pallet. There's no way to monitor that, per se. Now we have to use, now in Wisconsin, when you use a pallet, the wood has to be either kiln dried or it has to be in known infested areas, it has to sit and dry out for three years before it can be brought into lumber use. But that's only been in place for that place. That's a new result. That's a very new law. So, but China doesn't have that restriction. When we first figured out, found EAB, we were at a bafflement as to where this thing came from because there was nothing in the scientific literature that allowed us to identify it. And so they went out to the global botanist world and went, what the heck is this thing? And, ch and a scientist in China was like, oh, that's our little buggy thing. <laughs> I mean, it was literally, we have, we have a varietalist bugs native here. <clears throat> Ash trees and birch trees have native varietalist logs that are cousins of EAB, but they're in a war with the native trees. So they're there, but they don't kill it. 
But this particular bug is, again, over there, not a problem. It's not even noted by people. But once it's here, it can circumvent our native uh, defenses against it, and it just overwhelms the tree. So by the time we recognized it, it was already out of there. Yeah. Can't we feel like there's going to be a, a, a silver lining? Uh, there were, there's been a lot of invasive species in Lake Michigan, right. and some of the fish have eaten. Haven't evolved and they're dying out. And some of the fish have evolved and they're eating these invasive species. So after 50, 60 years, 100 years, can't we expect Mother Nature to help these um, come up with birds or other bugs to eat these bad bugs? Evolution unfortunately doesn't happen that quickly. And even if we had, say, a native fish in Lake Michigan that likes quite a mussels, it's not going to eat millions of them in a day. So we'll come to maybe some ecological balance, but in short, quagga will naturalize. It will always be present in the system, preyed upon by a native species and controlled. The limiting factor is going to introduce somehow. That's the best hope scenario. I mean, it basically, it's a dead lake right now, isn't it? No, no, we're not, no, no, we're not near that, but it's, 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 it's across the whole bottom. It is. It is. That's, that's a dead lake to me. Why do you say it's the know? near shore area, not the deep shore area. So those deep shore fishes aren't affected by quagga to the same degree the near shore environments are. And in a weird way, the only reason the lake is still functioning is because we pour nutrient in it. And, and <laughs> we, we feed the darn things, but we also feed the native ecology, which are being outcompeted by quagga. Mm -hmm. So it is our agricultural runoff that, for the moment, is maintaining the balance. But the quaggas get rid of the zebras, right? Yeah, to a large extent, yes. Yes. Zebras are now more common in inland lakes. Quaggas, we kind of recognize early on, and have slowed down their inland invasions. So zebras are off main lake. The next big fear is, of course, something like Asian carp. Yeah. So if Asian carp get into the red lake system, that, that will be pretty much the end of the morning. <laughs> well, why would anybody be against uh, stopping that from happening? I don't understand that. If you are from Asian cultures, Asian carp is a delicacy. So if you're in the United States and you want to make a million, you just need some carp. You don't have to take it in from China. So introduce it to your local lake, harvest it, and you make tens of thousands of dollars selling it to the local culture. If it escapes your captivity and gets into the whole system, hey! So we find a lot of these exotic Asiatic species have been introduced to the American waterways for that express purpose because there's a demand for the meat within certain cuisine cycles, and they want it, and they don't want to wait for it to fly in. And you want it fresh. You don't want a dead fish flying in from China. So local access. So I mean, if you have a cultural preference, the local culture may not have primary consideration in your thought process. It's kind of what it was. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, when you were talking about the water, the Amazon, the Amazon, the Amazon, the Amazon, is that something that is regulated, like when they did the beetles for for purple strike, where you have to get them from the DNR? It's absolutely regulated. It's, it's I mean, it's specific. not something that's yeah. just flying around on its own like right now. Well, with the wasp, well, the beetles we would like to do, but the beetles do not survive our winter well for purple purple uh, loose strike. So we have to intentionally introduce them, oh, okay. which means we have to breed them up, we have to introduce them, and they survive maybe one season. But that's usually enough to control purple loose strife for a season or two, and we can introduce them for a couple of seasons and go somewhere else, but there's a huge cost to that. So we don't do it every year. But with the wasp, it can survive and hopefully spread through the entire population and accelerate its demise. That is the whole thing. Because once the EAB dies out, the wasp dies with it, mm -hmm. because it's its only food source. But is it something that, um, <clears throat> like, you would have to do it through their DNR program, or would you? be able to get it like you can get other no, it's things that are um, helpful insects you can actually get by mail. No, you can't. Because you don't, there are so many cousins that don't do what we want. We don't want them here. And so if you're just buying it from a distributor, which one do you get? So the government, so the DNR very much restricts and has, if we're going to introduce this species, we know absolutely this subspecies or this particular bug, not its cousin because its cousin may not be due. Like Asian ladybugs lady, lady is an example of this. It was introduced, we thought, oh, these, these are Asian bugs, they're, gonna, they're not going to survive winter. We forgot that they hide in your house. 
They literally winter over in your siding and avoid the extremities of winter and then come crawling out everywhere in the spring. Talk to so, my niece who has, <laughs> like this deep one, she has, she vacuums it up every day. So those bugs are desperately trying to get out away from winter as much as we are, and as a result, we allow them to perpetuate in the environment. So they should theoretically have died out, but they just didn't account for the fact that they would find habitation with us for winter months. So they're still here. So this particular bug was studied for about 15 years until we're absolutely sure of the variety and its improbability of attacking native species. And now it's being introduced through DNR. It can be done by the basis. Okay. So, yes? I just, before everybody leaves, I just wanted to just throw into the conversation that um, cultivars and uh, non-native species such as um, the ginkgo tree, for instance, even if you're planting the male plant and it's not going to become invasive, it doesn't um, improve your biodiversity. So those are things to consider too, like if you are really interested in native plants and getting rid of invasive non-native species, then you should consider those things as well, the bio, you know, whether it's improving your biodiversity. Native cultivars and non-native cultivars are often cultivar to limit the reproductive success because we want to use them as a pretty, but we don't want them to leave. And so establishing native cultivars, for example, in a native landscaping is not always a good option because they don't reproduce well and they don't establish themselves like a true native one. So making that kind of choice, you want to take as close to indigenous and native on as you can in order to have the greatest success. Well, and, and also to, um, if, you're, if you're planting the plants in order to help you know, bees and you know, butterflies, then you need a true, you know, a true native plant, not a cultivar. So again, our natives will recognize a native plant. Mm -hmm. Honeybees don't care, but butterflies absolutely do. They're very species specific. Monarchs, for example. So I got milkweed growing in my raspberry bushes. They get along great. I get butterflies and berries. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's then you have to deal with this. It's a mess to clean up in the fall and so on and so forth. So not a lot of people want to do that. Personally, I feed milkweeds. <laughs> And again, a lead for this. Any other questions for you? So, you if so anybody's much. interested, I'm happy to give you my uh, my contact information at campus, uh, sharkyw at uwgb.edu. Uh, I'm happy to send out a copy of the presentation I showed tonight. She has a copy of it as well to share with you. Yep, which LNRP will have. So, you can look at that. Again, I have all those links up there. I would encourage you to check out uh, MIPIN and IPAW as a layperson. Again, you can get into those organizations, they have a lot of information. You can report recognized stands and they can create maps so that uh, agencies that are then acting to actively remove freight rainies and, and not leave and so on have an accurate map of where these populations are so that we can target eradication and, and, and make them easier. Mm -hmm. Of course, if it's on private property, we have to engage the private landowner more often than not, so it all depends on how engaged they are in carrying. Uh, while you're putzing, I do have a couple of books you can look through here while I'm here. Uh, this is featured on the IPAW website. It's a recognition of the major non-native plants here in the Midwest and um, control mechanisms as to how to control them and deal with them, both natural and chemical. Uh, this is an older uh, old DNR guide, uh, but again, it has the same thing, a key recognition of key plants. Uh, I can photocopy and scan this for you, and if you want any particular page out of it, you can look through that. And I have this fancy book as well. These are becoming more common called Alternatives. Uh, we like our fancy, shiny new gardens every year. Everyone wants to buy something, but you know, okay, you see that there. There are native alternatives maybe you hadn't considered that you should consider instead of planting the non-native variety. And this book kind of highlights the options by comparison to, this, to that. Uh, for instance, Oriental Bittersweet looks very similar to our native bittersweet, but it will take our native bittersweet and bury it in the cage fight. So uh, don't plant Oriental if you can do the native variety. Trust me, plant the native one, you right? <laughs> probably too. But uh, this book here is something you can look through to get some of those ideas. And then if you have just a passing curiosity, here's a breakdown of some basic plants and native plants just to get some visuals if you have some ideas. So these are here to look at while you're here. Of course, they have a couple of books back there. Thank you.